Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, folks. Everybody ready? All right, so for our 2 o'clock talk, we have Chris Romeo here. He will be speaking on application security awareness, building an effective and entertaining security training program. So without further ado, over to you, Chris. Thank you. All right, well, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Certainly is a uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I currently uh, live in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I came up here to uh, participate in the conference. I grew up in Saginaw, so this is kind of a connection, you know, back to home for me uh, to be here, kind of connecting my uh, professional and personal uh, existence. Uh, so I'll start with a question for you, and that is when you hear the term security awareness, what do you immediately think of? What, do you, what comes to mind first with security awareness? You probably all have security awareness programs in your organization. Yeah, people, okay, what else? So, posters, yeah, good good old posters with people showing bad things happening. Okay, and maybe one more. Okay, yeah, so, um, so I think that that's kind of the classical definition of security awareness. What I'm gonna share with you today is kind of a new category that we defined almost on accident at Cisco, something that we call application security awareness. And I'm going to spend some time telling you kind of what that means. So um, I'm currently the chief security advocate at Cisco. That's Cisco with a C, not with an S. Okay, I had that question once a couple of years ago. Someone said, oh, you work at Cisco. And I said, yeah. They go, do you drive a truck? I'm like, no, I don't drive a truck. Um, but yes, yeah, so Cisco with a C. And uh, over the last couple of years, my, uh, my main focus has been to, to launch this, this idea of application security awareness. And so... Um, would you believe that uh, we were able to reach 20,000 people within Cisco a as a part of this training? And we did it starting off with a core team of four people. So this is a really small group of people that got together to, to make something big happen. Uh, we did it with a budget of less than $50,000. Um, Cisco's a multi-billion dollar company, but we did this on a really, really on a shoestring. It took us about six months to launch and it was non-mandatory. So we got 20,000 people to go through a program that wasn't required with, by any corporate mandate. And I'll explain to you as we go through kind of why that was important. So here's my plan for my time here. First, I really want to take you through and share the story of, of what we did because I think that's really um, where, where there's some value. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the concept. You know, we have basically three main, main ideas, content, metaphor, and recognition that kind of wrap this program together. Uh, I'll share with you some of the systems that we have to make this fun for our users. And then uh, at the end, I've got 10 secrets of success that can help you understand um, well, how are we successful. You might be able to apply this doing your own type of training program in your organization. So we'll start with uh, content, metaphor, and recognition. Um, so back in 2012, I had the opportunity to go to the security development conference that Microsoft put on in Washington, D.C. And uh, Adobe actually got up and started to talk about this security training program that they created and um, how they'd had, you know, a couple thousand people in their organization go through it. They were training developers and testers and doing other things. And so I kind of sat there and I, I, my boss was next to me and I, I leaned over and I said, you know, why, why couldn't we do something like this? And he said, well, you can, um, <laughs> but without any, without any resources or money or anything like that to do it. Uh, but that's kind of where the idea started for me. And um, I really hate slides with lots of words, but this is kind of an important one because this is the actual slide we put together in 2012 to define what was the problem we were trying to solve with this training program. Um, the first one was Cisco, we didn't have a comprehensive end-to-end -end security training program. We had pockets, we had a course on um, Secure C programming, we had uh, introduction of threat modeling, we had all these different things spread all over the company, but there was nothing that tied them together and provided people incentive to, to kind of, you know, try and on purpose get better at what they were doing. Second thing is we, we found that um, the average, what I, I borrowed this term from Adobe, security IQ, but the average security IQ in our development organization was not where we wanted it to be. You know, people didn't, People didn't even know what threats and vulnerabilities and exploits were, much less SQL injection, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows, you know, kind of the, in the more, we'll be thinking more heavy type of things. Um, the third piece is uh, Cisco Secure Development Lifecycle. That's the team that I'm a part of. People, we found that people just didn't have a good understanding of how that could make their products better. And then the last thing, um, with the, the, you know, threat landscape increasing and, and getting bigger, uh, people just didn't have any appreciation for that. They didn't have any idea that things are getting a lot worse from an attacker perspective. So um, 
when we got into this, the, the four people that I did this with, um, none of us were experts in training, which I think is a lot of what you'll see as I go through this, what our success has been. We didn't know any better for a lot of the decisions that we made, and it turned out, you know, that, that created something fun. Um, I just found this quote recently, most employees view training as medicine or worse as punishment, because what we found in our program is it's the opposite. You know, we, we created a program that people found fun and engaging to get into. And so that's almost the, you know, something that we want to avoid from a training perspective. It shouldn't be punishment to have to go through and learn and make your products better. So this idea of application security awareness, um, this is the kind of the, the three pillars that um, I use to define this. Um, the first thing is just general knowledge. So this, this uh, colorful graphic represents our CSDL, our SDL process within Cisco. Um, it's basically, you saw some people earlier in the conference put up Microsoft's model. Microsoft has that linear. We used a circle because you're never getting off this thing. You know, you're, you're going to keep going around in circles and keep um, going through and, and applying the different things to make your product better. So we want knowledge, we want to instill knowledge about that within all of our, our developers, testers, hardware people. The second thing is um, we wanted to instill some knowledge of what's happened in the past. Okay, we have a, an organization called PCERT, Product Security Incident Response Team. Um, whenever we have a vulnerability, they're the people that issue the notices and do all the research and work with the you know, security researchers and, and people. Uh, but we wanted to bring in the things that, that have been found in the past and use that as a method to teach the future developers, here's some things that have gone bad in your product before. When you show somebody a vulnerability in their actual product, um, they really lean in a little bit closer and pay a little more attention. If I, if I talk about a problem in OpenSSL, eh, they just, they, they don't, it doesn't resonate, it doesn't connect with them. But when you talk about an ASA firewall and that's something that they develop for, they lean in a little bit and say, well, you're talking about something that I built now. They have some pride in it. Um, the third piece is action. So um, one of the challenges in a lot of training programs is it's all about knowledge. It's all about issuing knowledge to the person and then there's never anything, there's no call for them to actually go and do anything with it. Well, the third piece of, what, of application security awareness is we actually put people to work and have them do things to improve security in their products along the way. So um, what we did was, uh, and we borrowed this directly from Adobe, Adobe kind of borrowed from the Six Sigma model of using the belt system to do that. And what, what this does is it really gives people uh, an idea, something to achieve in the future. You know, at the top of this pyramid, I'm going to show you in a second is is a, what we call a Cisco Security Black Belt, and that's something that's within our organization has become a very coveted type of thing that people want to want to aim for. You know, it spawns. We have new college interns come in and they find out about this and they say, "Wow, I want to be a black belt. I want to get to that level of knowledge and, and action and experience." And so it calls people kind of as a way into it. But we start first with our white belt. So the most basic. Um, kind of the backbone of the program. Uh, we have some very simple things in here, like we have a module on security vocabulary. Okay, We found that just educating people on what a threat, exploit, vulnerability, those type of things, getting everybody that common knowledge and common, common you know, ability to say those words uh, was, was priceless when central security teams go to talk to somebody. You know, If you don't have to explain all the terms right up in the beginning, it's, it's a big, uh, big help. Um, the second part is the green belt. And this is where we start to apply some knowledge of specific roles at Cisco. So we broke them down, um, software engineer, tester, hardware engineer, and then we have a manager track for basically everybody else. Um, but what we do with the green belt is we're able to provide them some specific uh, learning, like a, a, a software developer can choose between a secure C co uh, set of modules or secure Java, depending on what they do. But for a tester, it doesn't make sense for a tester to do a secure C course. I mean, they might get some benefit out of it, but it's better to have them do courses on, you know, thinking like a bad guy and how to use all the test tools that we have. And I'll show you a little bit deeper, um, deeper view into the modules that make this thing up as we go. Um, then the next three belts go together because um, blue, brown, and black, this is where we, we put away all the modules, all the computer-based learning, and now we just give you a menu of things that you can go do. And when you earn enough points, then you reach the next belt level. Um, and that really, really allows us to transition from just feeding people facts to putting them to work and actually seeing improvements to Cisco's products, you know, on a, almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so when we do our video on demand, um, that, that's how we approach the first two levels, the modules that are there. Um, 
We've, we've kind of stumbled into a different approach than a lot of people do for training. So our setup, and you're seeing various pictures from different modules that we did, um, we use a conversational unscripted approach. Um, sometimes makes our uh, production people a little angry and makes it more difficult for them to keep up with what we're doing. But there really is, it's much more about security people having conversations than just reading off from a teleprompter. Because, you know, we've all, everybody in the room here has done a class at some point where you actually had to read off a teleprompter and you hated it as much as I would. So I, when we, one of our core tenets here when we started building this is we said, we're not going to make training that we think would suck. We're going to try and make something that we would like to do um, and actually listen to. And we found that when you have that conversational kind of talk show format, people are they're engaged. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, it's not unheard of for us to break into an argument right in the middle of, you know, a module or somebody starts to tell a story about, oh, well, one time this happened. Um, we do use uh, PowerPoint slides kind of as our guide, just so we don't, so we can finish within <laughs> within a, a good amount of time and not have you know two hour long training modules on vocabulary. Um, the other thing we do is we bring in subject matter experts from across the company. So uh, that was a way to really get a lot of people behind what we were doing. You know, if you have uh, people from in Cisco, we're a giant company, seventy thousand people. Um, thousands of different products. When people see people from their organization on the screen, it's once again, it's another connection point for them. Uh, we do, we also do what we call security metaphors. And the idea with security metaphors is really just to mix in a little bit of humor. Because in security training, we need some humor mixed in because we don't want to just be boring talking about facts. Um, We've done a couple of different series of these things. What you see in the top left-hand corner in our initial white belt, we just did some, uh, we had some still images that were some animations, not even animations, it was a poor man's animation. Uh, it was just uh, pictures drawn, and we wrote some little scenarios that kind of tried to tie into some core security concepts. And then when we got to our second, uh, to our green belt, we got a little more creative and we started to um, have this idea, well, we had this idea, what if you had ninjas show up in different places around the Cisco campus in normal, everyday, every workday kind of thing. Like, you know, that's a Cisco cafeteria. We put somebody in a ninja costume and, and, and made a little short video there with them telling jokes and things. Um, in the, on the left-hand side, we did a whole set of uh, little metaphor jokes based on office space, you know, which I just re I realized later that that doesn't, isn't as funny to people that just got out of college who may not have seen it, but um, it was funny to a lot of people that are, you know, I guess my generation. Um, and then the one on the bottom here was a, we did a ripoff of the Das Equis, most interesting man in the world. This was the most secure man in the world. And, uh, but just, just mixing in some of this fun is just a way to, to not make it too serious for people. And that's what, um, and we have to be careful not to go, not to cross the line. Okay, this is a this is a corporate program. Um, we had to we had to be rated. I, I tried to stay rated PG maximum at any time. We had a an author or a um, a writer, scriptwriter come in and write write some stuff for us. And his initial draft came back with an R, maybe a little bit higher than R rating. I'm like, I had to send it back to him and say, listen, you have to rewrite this for us because uh, I'm not going to go to the HR office and sit there all day where they yell at me because of all the things that you have in this. So, um, so PG rating was important for us as well. Uh, one of the so recognition was a huge had a huge impact on us being able to get 20,000 people to go through this, and um, we did this through a couple of different approaches. Um, what you see in the top left there, we actually uh, print out certificates and. Uh, send them to individual people when they earn belts here. And in, we've, what I found was in the United States, that's not as, you know, people aren't as interested in that. But when I go to India and I go to China, we have, you know, huge development centers there. And I walk down through the cubes, I see those things hanging on cube walls all the way through. So, you know, just the, the impact there is different cultures have different kind of recognition um, triggers. And what may not be as popular in the U.S. may be hugely popular, you know, elsewhere in the world. Um, what you see in the middle there, we actually had lanyards printed for each of the belts. Um, this turned out to just be a marketing push as well as a way for people to show off the level that they had achieved. Uh, so that was a good way to get more people involved. Um, we have some badges for our internal directory systems. And then money is always a good way to incentivize people. So for our white belt, we started recommending. Now, we didn't make this mandatory, but we recommended to any given manager that had someone pass the white belt, we said, why don't you give them $100? You know, we have these little, you know, awards you can give people that are monetary, small amounts. So why don't you give them $100 for, for putting in the effort to make your product more secure? And most of the people took us up on it and did it. And so that, I think that had a lot to do with um, our initial uptick that I'll show you in a second as far as how we, how we 
you know, had a lot of people go into it. Um, we did it via emails as well. Something as simple as an email to the employee and to the manager can really um, help them to, to really move it forward. So this is a kind of a view of what um, what the timeline looked like. So we're really just in about the about three years that we've been doing this. Um, 2012 is when we started and, and did that initial um, set of modules uh, in six months' time and launched it. And really, at that point, we had no idea. My, my director at that time said, um, after we launched right in, in late 2012, he said, you know, what's your metric for success here? I said, hmm, maybe 500 people. If I get 500 people to go through this, I'd be I'd call that a good year for 2013. Um, around February, March or so, we were at 5,000 or something like that, and it was just, the, the curve was just going straight up. So he called me the biggest sandbagger ever, you know, to as far as choosing, and he didn't take any more of my uh, my guesses as far as what I thought we were going to be able to do. So let's dive a little bit deeper, so you can see what are what makes up, um, you know, both the white belt and the green belt here. Um, so our white belt, we have these foundational modules, and these are designed for everybody. Okay, Cisco, we're, we've got 25,000 developers in a, in a 70,000 person company, so a lot, of, a lot of things that we focus on are going to be more technical developer type people. Um, but we also have a lot of people that are, that are not developers. So we, what we did is we split our white belt into two pieces. So what you see here, we think this is what applies to everybody. We ask everybody at Cisco to go through and do this. Um, and then the, I'll, I'll show you in a second what are the more, what we call our more technical modules for white belt. But just going through this, you know, I mentioned security vocabulary already. Um, Attacks and attackers is really just a super high level, you know, approach to why would somebody want to hack into a Cisco product? Why are they trying to find vulnerabilities? What's the money that's at stake? You know, things that people, everybody in this room just, we, we take for granted. We know that it's ingrained in us, but the average developer doesn't have a perspective. They don't understand, you know, they read the news, they hear about data breaches and things, but it doesn't, they don't necessarily make the connection to their everyday life. Uh, security myths was a fun one to go through and, and just break all the myths that the average person believes, like, you know, I have a firewall and I'm secure and it's encrypted so we don't need to worry about application security. All of those things, you know, we just went through and, and made, the, made people aware of that. Um, and then, you know, intellectual property, supply chain, you know, many other kind of basic things from the foundation. Now when we go to the advanced modules, um, these are the ones that are, you know, developers, testers, they're, they're continuing on and, and doing this. And so what you see on the left-hand side there, we did some analysis over a number of years, and these are the, the six buckets that we use to categorize the problems that have, that have generated vulnerabilities in Cisco products. So it's a, it's a pretty high-level perspective, but what we did is we said, all right, well, you know, for our basic level, our technical people, let's go make a simple module and just explain what is input validation because we found a lot of people didn't understand. You know, we, we, were, we were asking them to do something on our SDL that they didn't even know, they didn't understand, you know, what is whitelisting, what's blacklisting. So it's a pretty basic introduction to these types of problems. Um, but the other thing we did is we, we added three or four Cisco-specific examples in each of those modules. So we went, took a P-cert that had been released to the public, already been fixed, and then we included the details about the bug, and even sometimes we might have put a little snippet of source code just to say, you know, and here's where the problem actually existed. And once again, you're connecting with people that are building those products, and they understand, you know, what the, what the challenges are there. Um, hardware and crypto, you know, crypto is basically, we, anybody in this room would call it a crypto 101, you know, it's, it's what is encryption, decryption, you know, asymmetric, you know, just going through what are keys and things like that, but just, um, just setting kind of a basic level for people. So this is our, our um, adoption curve. And, you know, late in 2012 when we launched this and then kind of when we got into 2013, around March, February or March is where we started to really um, promote the product or the, the service as far as sending emails to people when they passed and, and, and whatnot. And that's where, and, and recommending that people give away money for those that complete it. And that's where we started to see this, this curve go up. And then 2014, um, we kind of hit critical mass where it wasn't a grassroots effort anymore. It was starting to get, high, you know, senior executives were starting to look at each, at their depart, their groups and saying, you know, building in some competition and that, that caused a lot more, a um, lot more to happen and get going. So um, really quickly, our green belt then is broken down into, uh, it's a little bit more complex because it's specific to the different types of roles. Um, everybody takes the same core modules, then they take some specific things, and then we give them some choices. Because we never know. Maybe there is a tester who really wants to understand security programming for some reason. Uh, we wanted to give them some flexibility so that they can control a little bit of their of their path in here. Um, 
So here's, here's some examples. I'm, I'm, the next two slides just give you a, a kind of a higher level overview of um, you know, some of these different categories. This is uh, the green belt itself, a current count, we have about 90 different modules that make this up. So these are just some representative examples of the categories and a few things underneath. Um, we, we dove deeper into the idea of attacks and attackers and, you know, actually broke down cross-site scripting and SQL injection. And then we actually threw in a social engineering one as well, just to, to make people aware. Then we've got some things we, we, on the manager side. We talked about resources and how everybody's, you know, security is everybody's problem at Cisco. Trying to get that point across. A, a deeper series on our CSDL, and then and then we did some advanced vulnerability. So these are the same categories I showed you for the white belt, but we have a couple of internal teams at Cisco that just do penetration testing and find all kinds of interesting things. Um, they get fixed before you know before they ever go out. Um, we actually had them come in and do some demonstrations of you know kind of you know different exploit chaining and you know and things that fit into those categories. So it was a little bit more in depth. And then here's some examples of um, some of the role specific things. I talked about the um, secure coding um, idea under software there. Um, we have something called Cisco SSL, which is our own version of OpenSSL. We try to roll into all the products so that we can control the, the, the fixed pipeline and things like that a little faster. Um, and then under hardware, you know, you configuration test, these are all. And on the test side, we had a number of our vendors that provide us tools. We asked them, we said, hey, we'd like you to come in and be part of what we're doing here, you know, from a, uh, from a module perspective. And um, I've got three different sets of modules under test where I had somebody from like Codenomicon actually came into our studio and recorded some modules with us and, and helped us kind of kind of make, make some things that are a little more specific for their tools. Um, so this is our, at the beginning of our answer to the so what question. Because this is, um, you know, when you're when you're talking about different training, the, you have to under you have to try and describe. You know, what what is the goal here? What is the you know what are you getting out of this? You know, because we've invested a whole lot more than fifty thousand dollars at this point. You know, that that was just the initial uh, amount that went into that white belt. Once we started to show some success, then they just started throwing money, you know, in our direction to make it happen. And what you see uh, modeled up here is we started to send a survey to those people that as they finish their green belt. And what we're really asking them to do is, we're asking them, before you did your green belt, how would you have responded to this question? And then after you have your green belt. You know, so um, the first one is, you know, plan and allocate sufficient time for our SDL mandated activities. You know, before, so we're trying to, trying to gauge, have we had an, an impact on behavior change? Because if we don't have a behavior change, then, you know, we're just blowing smoke and, and you know, making a lot of noise. Um, and what we found is, you know, in a number of different categories here, you see behavior increases. You know, we've got them stacked up there. But in our particular CSDL activities, we saw um, almost a 60% change in the, in the survey respondents saying, you know, um, I, did, I did a lot more of this stuff after, after I went through this green belt. Um, and some of them are, are considerably lower, but um, we're going to continue to model this because this is, this is how we justify the, you know, the, what we're doing in the program and, and the improvements we want to make in the future. Okay, so when we switch into our, our what we call our advanced belts, now, now, now is when we get into the actual action. And, um, so what you see here is our, a very simple approach that we've taken to provide a menu. Uh, one of the challenges that we saw that we could have in the future is if we created a menu with 1,200 different items, it just becomes really hard to manage and, and understand. Uh, so what we did is, and you might look at this list and you might go, oh, that's really generic. And if that's, your, if that's the, your response, then we've achieved what we tried to do. We wanted these things to be a generic because in all honesty, I really don't care as much about the category. I care more about the activity. I care about somebody actually doing something to improve security. And, you know, I, so that's why we don't argue with when somebody puts something in a given category. You know, this is just to give them some ideas. And so, you know, under the forge, this is where we're encouraging people to build stuff. You know, whether it's test tools. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things. Whether it's a process or maybe a, or something else. We also want them to build partnerships. And I'll show you here in a second when we, how this breaks down to different levels in the organization. Uh, but we're big on community. And then on the teach side. So we do give people the opportunity to take some courses under the teach and earn some points from that perspective. You know, so they can still acquire some knowledge, you know, within this. 
Uh, mentoring is a huge thing. We're almost everybody so far who's achieved the highest, the, the brown and black belts has a string of people that they're mentoring, that they're just recording points for, which I think is just a, it's an, it's an awesome impact of this is we have senior people that are, you know, bringing up more junior people along the way. We let people teach and teach courses, deliver presentations. Um, and then on the research side, they may, it may be as far as, you know, designing, developing new features and, you know, kind of looking at issues and things. And then on the implement side, that's where they're actually building new features in Cisco products, you know, um, maybe building tests or implementing a strategy. But that gives people a lot of different possibilities because, um, we wanted to ensure that this wasn't specific to a developer, specific to a tester. We want anybody at Cisco to be able to find something that they could do under this system to earn some points and, and make security, you know, kind of overall better. So each of those ones I showed you on the previous screen um, has four different levels that go with it. And each of those levels has, you know, different level, a certain number of points that goes along with it. And um, if we use delivering a presentation, so as an example, um, a level one delivering a presentation is when somebody just goes to their own team, you know, there are 10, 15 people on their team and they deliver a, a talk on something, you know, that's, that's a benefit to the team to improve security. Now a level four for, for that is when they go out into the community, they're at a conference presenting, they're, you know, um, they're doing something at a much higher level than, you know, impacting their own team. And Level one and level four, they both have a positive impact for, for Cisco. So we don't have a problem if somebody wants to string together, you know, 20 or 30 level one activities because they don't want to stand in front of people at a conference, for example. That's okay because they're still doing the things to, you know, improve the overall security. The other thing that de de decides whether something's a level one, two, all the way up to four is the amount of time that goes into it. So like for the example of where somebody's implementing a new security feature or, you know, a new feature with some um, security capabilities, um, the, the point value is basically attributed to an individual hour. So if somebody's designing a big mega feature that's going to provide a whole new security subsystem in a product, they're likely going to fall in under a level four because they probably spent 40 hours or more, you know, on that individual activity. Um, so we definitely want to, want to, um, you know, just raise awareness of the different types of activities and reward people for doing big things, but also reward them for doing little things because we want everybody to be able to, you know, be part of making um, security at Cisco better. Uh, so we, I wish we had more, uh, you know, high-end tools for the, the tracking here, but we just use an individual wiki. So we ask each uh, person, we have a, a set wiki site where they can create their own record and then they have to go through and they have to give us some details. So you can't just say I delivered a presentation, give me 40 points. You have to, you have to say I delivered a presentation and here's the URL to the conference proceedings where you can see um, my name. Now, do I go and check all of them? Not a chance. But I'm just trying to, you know, ensure that people don't just completely try to game the system. You know, we, um, we probably look at about half of them now and we envision that in the future that'll drop to almost <laughs> to very, very few spot checks going on. But we're trying to build the system to, you know, provide a, a way that has some checks and balances in it as well. So they put their activities, um, if they have an internal document that's referenced, they give us a link to that. You know, if they did a presentation for their team, we ask them, hey, give us a link to the internal document. And one of the other things that we, we've found is that this gives us a lot of um, opportunities to spread security community across the company because we, we've, from our central team perspective, we've learned about a lot of cool things people are doing that we had no idea were happening in the company. And then we can see that and then we can promote what they're doing and, and bring other teams and say, wow, you know, um, here's, a, here's a way that somebody else might be able to um, take advantage of this new library you created. Let's get the word out because, you know, a week ago I might not have even known about it from my central, you know, viewpoint, but it's about getting that word out to, um, to others as well. Uh, as you make your way up through the, uh, the process here, <coughs> we, for the, first, for the blue belt, you can do all your activities in one of these four categories if you want. But as you start to get high, higher up here, you see, you know, for the brown belt, you got to do something from at least two of the categories. And for a black belt, you got to do something for at least from three of the categories. And the idea behind this is we really, when somebody gets to that, those higher levels, we don't want them to just hide in their, in their cubicle and write test scripts all day long. You know, that'll get them to the blue belt. Um, but we want to, we want to try and make and, and, and encourage them to be more well-rounded. You know, get out and do something under teach, you know, stretch yourself, mentor somebody. You know, for some people that's a, that's a big challenge for them, but that's also what we're trying to do here is, is push people, you know, a little bit further to, uh, you know, to do bigger things. 
Um, so yeah, we do. Uh, so this is basically just the way that the the process works as far as how we how we go through. You know, they register. We have a tool that they register their activities and they update their wiki. If they've got enough points, the system allows them to submit, and then we go into our review process where we can manually approve or deny people. You know, from each individual flow. Um, here's some stats I pulled from the wikis uh, a couple of months ago. Just to, it'll give you a little bit of perspective about what types of things are people doing. You know, within within Cisco to earn points along the way, and you'll see. You know, not, I guess not. Probably shouldn't be surprising. Taking a course yeah, kind of was up there at the top because a lot of people were doing that already, and um, I guess it's they thought of it was a little easier. But I was surprised that there was so many presentations that were actually happening. You know, that 203 means there were. You know, when I checked this a couple of months ago, there were 200 different presentations that had been delivered that people were earning points in our system for. So, you know, we see that as a, as a positive impact. Um, we do also allow people, uh, we do allow them to claim one security certification if they have it and it's current. So they can get 40 points right away if they have a, you know, um, CISP, CEH, we get pretty much all the major security ones. We, we just, we accept those as, you know, giving you one way to get some points. A lot of people have masters in, in different security domains and stuff. So we gave them points for that as well. Um, Partnerships. There's an example. Somebody actually wrote it. They created an activity and they said, you know what, I'm going out and I'm meeting with my director and I'm trying to explain to them why we, they have to, you know, ensure we have the right security coverage in our backlog in the agile process. So, I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge impact when there's a, you know, a, a member of technical staff that's actually going after, after their director and saying, you know, we got to do something different here to make it better. Um, so, you know, the ultimate goal of what I'm doing here is I'm trying to create this, what I call the tidal wave of security culture change. You know, and, and the reason I, I use that is I think right now we're still in the relatively early phases of, of these advanced belts. You know, the wave is actually really small right now. But the more activities and the more people that get behind this, the more, the bigger the wave becomes. And, you know, my overall goal is to, you know, be able to look back five years from now and say, you know, Cisco's perceived differently now. At, with their approach to security and you know I'm I'm just hoping that's where we'll end up but I think we're going you know kind of in the right direction um, so yeah we uh, yeah, this is this is kind of our mantra within you know within we, we use this idea of security ninja you know it can be a little bit corny but um, it, it really just caught in, caught on as a marketing as a marketing term you know within the company and we borrowed that from Adobe they, they named their program that and then we, we borrowed it and, and followed along but um, you know, for the average non-security person, saying they're security ninja just has a certain amount of value to them. And, you know, we were able to kind of go with it. Uh, from a systems perspective, so we have a website we call the Cisco Security Dojo where we let people launch the training from. It's really, you know, just a, just a series of, of links and clicks and things. Um, we also have this tool called our Security Insights Dashboard. And what this is, this is an executive level, but it's available to everybody in the company. And what it does is it allows, um, I just showed you John Chambers' view from the top here, uh, but you can actually, I can click on that and I can, you know, have a, a drop down that goes through the entire organization. So I can go to John Chambers' direct reports and keep find, kind of going down. So anybody that's a manager can find themselves in this system and see, you know, what percentage of uh, ninja white belts do they have. Um, so what, what you see here is this, you know, from Chambers' perspective, everybody at Cisco reports to him at the moment. Um, so 23,224 people have achieved a white belt. That's 20, almost 25% of our regular employee population at this point. And then we provide our numbers, you know, for our green belts and advanced belts along the way here. But this is a really nice tool because it allows different executives to see where they fit against their peers. And we definitely used that to our advantage about a year ago. So we were able to say, um, hey, did you look and see your peer here? They're at 50% and you're at 2%, you know, of, of white belts that you've in your organization. And that caused, you know, I mean, we know executives aren't real, you know, not real competitive people amongst their peers. They're really docile and not at all. They were, that, that spurned them on to be, you know, able to go and uh, actually make stuff happen there. Okay, so um, let me let me just run through this, the the ten secrets of success that we found. These are really the lessons learned. Um, a lot of these I learned later, so our initial attempts didn't necessarily follow these. But this is the the things that if you were going to say, you know, I'm going to go do a program like this myself. This is this is the ten things I would encourage you to take a look at very closely. First secret was the 20 minute module. Okay, so we have a maximum. 
20 minute module time frame. We don't do 21 minutes. If we end up with 21 minutes of video, that means we got to go cut out a minute. Um, and but even as we've become gone a little further now, we're even trying to get closer to 10 minutes on a given module. Because what we found is if you have to listen to an hour and a half long module, we all are going to go do something else. You're going to leave it playing in the background and go do something else that you have to do. But Adobe actually brought, you know, kind of led us into this. Um, and, and this is true at Cisco as well. When somebody's doing a build of a particular piece of code, the amount of time it usually takes them is about 20 minutes. So what they usually would do is go play and do something else, and now we were able to kind of channel them into being able to do an actual module along the way. So um, it may mean you have to do some reduction in your content, do some editing and whatnot, but keep it, keep it smaller and people will become more attached to it. And it allows them also to do one module a day for six weeks. I had a lot of people do that. We had, we've had the, um, the crash crowd who would go do this all back to back. It takes about six hours to do the white belt. They would do it all in one. And then the other side is people that say, over six weeks, I'm going to do one module per day and just plug away on it. So both of them work. Second thing is the uh, subject matter expertise. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, we had this collaborative pool of folks who were helping us to create content. They were coming on the, on the videos and recording with us, and they were also spread from all across Cisco. So when you have that, that group of different people, um, it just helps everyone else to, to kind of buy into what we're doing. Um, so start with a small group, you know, do a pilot, and then just try to build up from there. But take advantage of the reputation that certain people have in your organization. And when we created those first modules, I, I specifically went after about 15 different people in the company. I said, I need you to come and speak about crypto. Because when someone says crypto at Cisco, there's a guy named David McGrew. He writes crypto standards and things. He's the person that comes to their mind. So I said, I got to have you come and, and be that person on camera with us. Uh, third secret is recognition. You know, it's uh, like real estate, location, location, location. Well, we found recognition three times over was really a huge part of our success, uh, both the financial and just just it's amazing how many people go through their average work week or work month and their boss never actually tells them they did a good job at anything. So I actually did it for them. I wrote it in this email that went to the individual user and CC to the manager. And just, I think people, they just enjoyed being recognized for doing something that was going to have a positive impact. Um, your organization might be different than ours. I think everybody's going to have a slightly different approach to recognition, but, you know, use what you have within your culture. Um, this is a hard secret of success to say because our program went viral, but I don't necessarily have a equation that says here's how you're going to take this in your organization and and people are going to be drawn to it you know um, I think our recognition played heavily into you know that what you saw in that chart where it went straight up as far as the people that were that were um, signing up for it and being a part of it but um, whatever you can do to to build that viral kind of grassroots nature to the program is definitely the way to go um, okay higher instructional design help before I started this I didn't even know what an instructional designer was okay and then what I did was the first round I wrote a whole bunch of test questions and it turns out I'm not very good at writing test questions. I'm actually terrible. Um, turns out triple negatives are actually possible in a question. I wrote a question with a triple negative. Someone pointed out. I'm like, wow, I knew double negative. I didn't do it on purpose, but um, the takeaway here is test questions are it's so hard to write good test questions uh, on your own. There are people that study the whole art of writing test questions. We went out and, and uh, hired some of them, had them come in and write the questions, and the feedback level has plummeted for people saying that question's not fair, that question sucks. Um, so it's totally worth the very small investment to bring in experts to do the questions type of stuff. Uh, I mentioned the competition already. This is, you know, uh, pitting executives against each other, using the dashboard to say you're not necessarily, a, you know, doing as well as as your peer, and and um, you know, letting letting people be driven by that. Um, secret number seven: break all the rules. Okay, I said this right at the beginning. I had no idea how to build a training program when this started. I'd never been on camera, never done any of these things. So a lot of the a lot of the success we had um, came because we didn't know any better. So if somebody would have you know, and, and right now, three years into this, our whole our learning team now is coming back and pushing us to do things certain ways. And a lot of times, I got to put up my hand and say, "No, this program we don't do it like that." That's how you guys build corporate training. This isn't corporate training. This is something different. So, um, it's important to you know avoid that. We always do training this way. When somebody says that, you know, you're in huge trouble. But you know, make something that that you would think is fun and you would have fun consuming, and other people will as well. 
uh, creative people. So um, we have a we actually have an organization. We're we're uh, lucky within Cisco. We have a, a whole TV studio organization that that we can go into a studio and they have all the cameras and everything. But um, the real secret of success, though, is that we partnered with those people and they really got our vision. They got the fact that we were a little bit wacky and that we wanted to have fun and not be you know just talking head executive type people. And so they were able to then influence us and, and you know, I showed you some of those metaphors before. They wrote a lot of those themselves because they actually had fun, you know, doing those and, and producing them for us. So partnering with creative people that get you is, is also very important. Uh, senior exec buy-in. Um, John Stewart is our chief security officer and also the person that I report up through his organization. And uh, right from the beginning, he was a, a huge supporter. As soon as he got word of what we were doing, um, he actually was portrayed in one of the very early metaphors dressed up like Neo from the Matrix, um, just to get the point across to different developers in our organization. So he was really behind it, and I think that was that also helped with our success. Um, gamification, this is a huge thing in the world of training right now. It's how do you turn your training platform into a video game so people can click through and, and do things like that. And um, that's, what we, that's what we did with this. Um, so I showed you some of the, the totals there, but this is just once again, these are the number of, of individual belts that we've awarded. Um, I'm pretty proud of kind of where we ended up here along the way. Um, one thing you'll notice under the green belts, there's uh, almost 3,000 unique learners, and then there's almost 3,400 people that have done the green belt. We've had some people go through and do all four different roles, because I don't know, I think they're just classic overachievers or what the case was, but they did, they, they went through and did, you know, a lot more than they had to there. Um, so I talked about application security awareness. You know, this is knowledge. It's historical information from your organization that plugs in to help people learn. It's also action. I think that's the most important thing that we've accomplished here so far is it's not just about feeding facts into people's heads. It's then they're going to go out and do something with it and make, you know, make our company better. Um, I don't, I, I offer you an example here. This is definitely not a blueprint. You know, if you take Cisco's program and Adobe's program, um, there's some very core things that, that we learned from Adobe, but then we went a lot of different directions. So, um, this is, should give you an idea of what you could do, but your culture will be different than ours. And, you know, your humor tolerance might be level or less or maybe more than ours. You know, you might be able to do some different things there. So, um, but really the takeaway here is that, you know, I think we're proof that, <clears throat> and, and, you know, you can do this for almost any organization. Um, we did it on a real small amount of money, a real real small group of people in the beginning, and that's a lot of our success. Is we piloted small, and then we you know we're, we had some success, and that's when the the, the rest of the organization really got behind us and um, and helped us to go. So with that, I will uh, be happy to take any questions or anything that anybody might have about what we did, sir. So all this is done on company time. Oh yeah, this is uh this is a it was it was corporate. Um, yeah, so this was, I shouldn't say it was all done. Um, out of those first four people, I had two people from, from different businesses within the company who were doing it in their nights and weekends job type of approach. Um, I was lucky that I was coming from the central team. Now, I wasn't able to get more people, but all, all of those subject matter experts, those were all nights and weekends type of types of thing. And that was, at current count, we had like 100 people that helped us with the white belt. We had about 500 total that helped us with the green belt. And those were all nights and weekends, though. They all had day jobs, and they would they, they sacrificed to help us along the way. So yeah, that's that's and that's you know I think a common problem that most anybody's going to have is that you're not going to be able to sell something like this and get resourced right off the beginning. You're going to have to you're going to have to pilot, and when there's some you know some response. Uh, the subject matter experts that. Um, not, not, I don't think I had it. Maybe one manager out of those people. Most of them are just tech leads that are, you know, responsible for particular features or architects, things like that. Um, it helped that they had some experience with security as well because then they could, you know, that was, that's what made them an SME in the program. Yeah. This one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's already out there. It's, it's, I've talked about it a couple other places as well. Yeah. So I'm sharing it at the moment. So I have no choice at this point. But yeah, definitely. Um, you can, you can uh, send me an email. I'll send you a copy. No problem. Any other questions? For, uh, once somebody earns a bell, is that just theirs permanently, or can they lose it if they don't do opportunity? That's a great question. So the, we do have a maintenance program for the white belt. Uh, because we saw we had 20,000 people that 
you know, not all of them are going to go through and do something. So what we, we haven't implemented it yet, but our idea is that once a year we're going to, we're going to have an, a couple modules they have to do to maintain their white belt. And if they don't, then we'll remove them from the list and, and kick them back through. But yeah, it's, that's a great point. We want to make sure the, the mass audience is never going to go past the white belt. So we want to keep our communication with them and keep updating them on the things that are crucial to them. We're reaching, we're, we're having that happen now. I'm actually seeing internal job postings. Now people are referencing it. You know, you must have your Cisco security green belt in. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't for any particular project. So in my role as, as part of the CSDL central team is just to make Cisco a better, more security culture aware. And so we just did this to, and just turned it loose on the whole company to see, see where we'd land. Uh, turnover, do you, what do you mean? People that, that like, don't. Uh, new people coming in, they would have had a tactics. So a, a greater demand for that skill set within Cisco exists than there are greater demand for that skill set. Ah, okay. Employees. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of employees. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, you know, at the, at the, at the lower levels, it's, it's, it's pretty basic as far as, you know, the white belt is really just what we, we, we in the room would say basic security knowledge. Um, and then the green belt is specific. In the green belt, though, we're teaching them. What do they need to know as a software engineer to be successful in CSDL? You know, we're teaching them about threat modeling, about you know, secure C, those types of things. So we can we can build some of those those skill sets uh, into them. Uh, but yeah, the we've been trying to really stay away from the mandatoriness because I don't know. I mean, um, Cisco just doesn't Cisco people don't react well to mandatory. Like if I told people from the beginning they had to do this, my chart would be like straight across. They wouldn't it wouldn't have been prolific. Yeah, we just left, we left it wide open because we figured, you know what, contractors are, are coding for us and they're testing for us. Sure, some of them are going to take that knowledge and go elsewhere, but I was willing to make that, you know, that didn't bother me because at the moment they're focused on our stuff and that's what I wanted to do is, is you know, do that. So, since you No, we just borrowed their eye. No, we just borrowed their idea. Yeah. No, we borrowed their idea because the concept is so, so dri it drives people to want to reach the higher levels. So. Okay. Well, hey, thank you very much. I'll be hanging around for a little while.